1470 light years away, in the constellation Cepheus, lies a mysterious object. A reflection nebula, known in fact as the Ghost Nebula, and noted in the VDB catalog as Object 141. The Ghost Nebula has a magnitude of 9.4, far too dim for the human eye to detect, but it is out there, none too far from the better known Iris Nebula. Dim and dark, small at only two light years across, waiting to be revealed. And here, at the Sky Story Observatory, that is the task before me tonight. We are going to take this very powerful telescope with 203 millimeters of aperture and 1240 millimeters of focal length and, come sundown, align it perfectly at the dim and elusive Ghost Nebula and see if, over the course of this long cold night, we can tease out its mysteries and details hidden beneath delicate wisps of cloud and stardust, and concealed by the vast distance of over a thousand light years. We bring some of the best of modern technology to the task, a powerful schmidt cassegrain telescope guided by an exceedingly accurate mount and driven by a tiny computer not much bigger than a deck of cards, yet tens of thousands of more times more powerful than the computers that were used to send the astronauts to the moon. We have a clear night of excellent seeing with only a half moon that won't even rise till after 3 a.m. and nearly nine hours to accomplish this task. So let's get onto the computer and see if we can bag us a ghost. Bagging this ghost begins with booting up my favorite planetarium, Stellarium, and using it, I can see from my position here in the world that the ghost nebula will be well up over the horizon all night in fact, when I first start filming it, it's going to be around 20 degrees. In some regions of the world, persons might consider that too low. But as I have nothing here in the way of light pollution to contend with, and only the ocean over the horizon in every direction, shooting low on the horizon like that isn't a problem at all. So long as whatever I'm imaging doesn't go below the tree line, which is at about 15 degrees in every direction. With all systems and the mini PC activated at the observatory, the next step is to log into NINA and using the Sky Atlas, locate VDB141. Once loaded, I'll send it over to the framing tab where the target will be locked and loaded, ready for filming to start later in the evening. When the Ghost Nebula shows up in the framing tab, zooming in quickly shows that it will fill much of the camera frame. And from there begins the process of setting up a camera sequence, wherein I will tell NINA what parameters to use on the camera to film this deep sky object through the night. Nautical dark begins here at 8.44 p.m., and that's when I will begin imaging. But before the imaging process actually happens, it's important to run a plate solve in order that Nina will know which way the mount is pointing. From there, Nina can orient the telescope toward the target. And before plate solving can work, we need a perfect focus. So long before it's nautical dark, as soon as it's dark enough for focusing to work, I'll run a focus sequence. A test exposure at 8.16 reveals that it's finally dark enough that an autofocus sequence can be run. There's nothing like the feeling of a J-hook autofocus sequence coming together is there. And as soon as the sequence is completed, I'm going to run a three-point alignment. Now, the telescope sits on a permanent pier in the observatory, so we don't technically need to run an alignment. But I find a three-point alignment is often the surest and easiest way to properly plate solve the mount. And since I'm doing this well before nautical dark falls and I want to begin filming the sequence, there's plenty of time for the couple extra steps involved in a three-point alignment. This alignment, though, revealed that the mount is nearly two minutes off. I suspect that's more of just an error in the measurement, though I suppose it's possible with temperature changes, the pier could very slightly shift, especially as I was adjusting some equipment on the telescope earlier. And since this is a small target that requires a high focal length telescope, I'm going to need extra precision. So I'm just going to run out to the observatory about 100 meters from the cottage with the laptop and quickly adjust that alignment while I'm out there. Once the alignment was adjusted to no more than a reported 15 seconds of error, I had the mounts go ahead and slew to the Ghost Nebula. And after the slew, I ran another autofocus routine. If slewing more than a few degrees, you should always rerun the autofocus routine because changes in the angle of a telescope changes its view through the atmosphere. 
and that can slightly to significantly shift the focus. The camera is controlled in Nina with a sequencer. There's a legacy and an advanced sequencer. I like the advanced sequencer, it gives a lot of control. And I have a number of templates for various degrees of automation and various camera setups. Tonight I'm going to be using my basic template for LRGB filters on the monochrome camera. And this sequence provides for automatic meridian flips, automatic correction if the camera should drift off target, for example, if a cloud might get in front of the, the target for an extended period of time, and automatic restoration of guiding if there should be any prolonged guiding problems that might otherwise cause PHD2 to stop. The Ghost Nebula will be shot for 60 second exposures, with the Player One filter wheel shooting through the luminance filter for 60 minutes, and then switching to the red, green, and blue filters each for 20 minutes after which the whole cycle will start all over again. And the sequence will end the cycle automatically at nautical dawn at 5.41 a.m. The graph just above middle center right shows how the ghost nebula will track through the sky during the night. Filming will begin at its lowest point at about 20 degrees, and it will ascend through the night, not peaking till well after dawn tomorrow morning. But it will be clear and high in the northern horizon through the night. I'm only going to shoot 60 second subs. Sometimes I shoot them even shorter. 45 seconds, half a minute, 15 seconds, or shorter still. Short subs will present more accuracy, since any errors in guiding will have less opportunity to show. And they have another inherent advantage. The more subs are stacked, the more noise in the image is cancelled. In terms of managing noise, you get better outcomes the more subs you shoot, in general. There are always exceptions, but that would be a topic to explore in a different video. This does mean that my subs are going to be each individually quite dim, but it doesn't matter. In the stacking process, the light captured in each sub will simply be added to the last, essentially painting layer upon layer of light over the image, giving a complete image of the ghost nebula in the morning if all goes well. The first sub of the sequence is exposed. I can see in this that there is a very slight collimation error in the SCT telescope. Now, I knew that error was there already, but it is very minor, and there is no way I'm going to waste a crystal clear night of excellent seeing adjusting a collimation error. That's a job for a night with a full moon. The error that's there is so minor, I can easily correct it in post-processing in the morning. And the good seeing provides for good tracking too, with a total error of about 0 0.73. A monochrome camera using a luminance filter gathers roughly twice the light as a color camera, which astrophotographers sometimes refer to as a one-shot color camera, or OSC. This means that, running the luminance filter, a monochrome camera operates a full s-stop faster than color cameras. Now, color cameras have their advantages in certain situations, but when filming a very dim target through a high focal length, high f-ratio, or slow telescope, a mono camera is highly advantageous which is why I pretty much exclusively use a monochrome camera on the schmidt cassegrain scope. And the Ghost Nebula, though a dim and challenging target, is showing up pretty well. At this point, the processes of the mount, telescope, and mini PC are largely automated. But, to be honest, I'm a big believer in Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will. So, I don't like to leave the system unsupervised. So I sleep tonight in the lab near the computer and wake up every hour to check the progress of the system. And with every hour, it's as if we are drawing closer to that mysterious wonder, that ethereal beauty that is VDB-141, the ghost. When dawn breaks, clear, sharply cold and blue, there are nearly 560 second subs recorded on the external SSD that was attached to the mini PC through the night. And all of us who share this passion that is astrophotography know that that is both an exciting and anxious moment when you recover those images. Did everything work well through the night? Did the sky cooperate? Was there a system failure somewhere? Was the focus good? Countless worries go through our minds when we gather those subs. And we won't know, sometimes till hours later, depending on how many subs there are to process, whether or not our efforts were a success. So before I head in and process, one other task must be done. Flat frames must be shot to calibrate out dust and other aberrations that might have occurred on the lens. It's a simple process of pointing the telescope straight up and setting a light source over the top of the telescope and filming anywhere from 40 to 80 very brief images with the histogram showing about one-third elevation. 
which is just bright enough to reveal where the aberrations might be on the lens. The stacking software will later use these flats to identify lens errors and calibrate them out of the final images. If shooting with a one-shot color camera, you only need one shot of flats. As last night, I was using a mono camera and shooting an LRGB with four filters, luminance, red, green, and blue. I'll need a separate set of flats for each filter. Really, fresh flats should be shot with every new image, since new dust can land on the telescope overnight and change things since the last set of flats were shot. You should also have a bias calibration frame. However, bias calibration frames last a long time, and I typically only shoot these two or three times a year. And a single bias frame is good for all the filters. So, the one I'm using I shot almost two months ago. The light panel I'm using for the flat frame is a simple light box used by artists for drawing and painting. Its light is adjustable from very dim to very bright, and it'll run basically forever on a single inexpensive USB power pack. At the dimmest setting, it is perfect for shooting flat calibration frames on the big aperture of the SCT. Processing really begins with calling the lights, the subs on which the images were captured. To get the sharpest, best images, you want to keep only those which were well focused and unhindered by clouds or other unexpected objects such as satellites passing through the image. I like to do my calling with Irfan View, which gives a large clear view and allows me to instantly delete any subs I don't want without having to go dig through the files to find them. And in PixInsight, I'll run the weighted batch processing script, which does a beautiful job of processing the flat frames along with the master bias and all the lights, calibrating out all the errors and the noise in the stacking process and putting together the hundreds and hundreds of light subs into our final image. So many subs takes a long time to process, especially since I drizzle everything times two. And the subs from each separate light filter, the luminance, red, green, and blue subs have to be processed separately. I always start by processing the luminance filters because when they're done, I'll finally have a good sense of whether the previous night's efforts were worth it. Processing begins. And finally, the moment of truth. Look at that. That's the luminance filter. And it's a complete success. Now to go about stacking the lights from the red, green, and blue filters. When each set of lights is separately stacked, the four individual images form a collage of the same target. There will be star aligned to line them up perfectly with one another, and each one will be given a short designation to make it easier to work with, L for luminance, R for red, and so on. The red, green, and blue channels only are then combined using the channel combination tool. The output image is designated ghost RGB, and spectrophotometric color calibration is run to color balance it. Blur exterminator is then run twice on the output image, the first time on correct only mode to clean up the collimation errors mentioned earlier. Then on the standard mode to deconvolve the stars and sharpen up the nebulous structure. Star exterminator is then run only on the RGB stars, which are then histogram balanced and set aside to reunite with the image later. The starless RGB version of the ghost nebula is histogram balanced and then the curves are adjusted. And a very similar process is then run separately on the luminance channel. Finally, the RGB and luminance data are recombined with the LRGB combination tool. Though the stars from the luminance channel are discarded as I feel they are too bright. The PixInsight side of processing is finished, and now we move to Affinity Photo. Here, refinements of the image will be carried on using a technique to separate the high and low bands of information, and operations to refine sharpness will be applied with unsharp mask clarity and high bandpass tools. And then, using what I think is a fairly unique process, I'll divide the image into three separate layers and recombine them to maximize the signal-to-noise ratio a technique I find especially useful with a naturally dim subject such as the Ghost Nebula, and which will be covered in a later video. And then finally, the separate star panel that we created in PixInsight is aligned back over the image and set for a screen composite so that they show up perfectly over the image, whereupon I can use another curves tool and run an inverse C on it to darken the stars to the brightness that I want to maximize the view of the Ghost Nebula. If you're unfamiliar with the development of astroimages, this probably all sounded like Greek. Feel free to explore the catalog of videos on my channel, Sky Story, where presently there are nearly a hundred videos, many of which deal with the capturing and editing of astrophotos. 
I know it's a lot to learn and it's a long journey. But when you learn how to handle that telescope and make it in the mount and all the equipment do what you want, and then to understand how all of the information that you gather works and how to process it and transform that light into a final image. Well, you get something like this and then suddenly you know the entire long journey was worth every step. Thank you for joining me on this journey as we unveil the beauty and the wonder of the mysterious Ghost Nebula. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know, leave a comment below. And if you don't mind, please take a moment to hit that like and subscribe button. And feel free to explore the videos on both astronomy and astrophotography. And for those of you who already have telescopes, and cameras, and mounts, you know what comes next. Get out there and shoot the sky.